Hi everyone, I'm the RSPB's Visitor Experience Officer at Minsmere. Um, I've worked at Minsmere now for 20 years, um, or at least I will have done in a couple of weeks time. Um, so hopefully I know the reserve pretty well. Um, and uh, what I'm going to give you tonight is a, a virtual tour of uh, Minsmere's uh, habitats, uh, species, uh, uh, history and, uh, and facilities. So uh, uh, there will be time for some questions at the end. Um, but I hope you uh, enjoy your tour of Minsmere. Um, so, Minsmere's history began, began uh, long before the RSPB were, were present there, uh, and particularly uh, a key part uh, was the Second World War. Um, and when, when various measures were put in place to try to prevent uh, the anticipated invasion uh, of German troops on the low-lying Suffolk coast, uh, and you can see here just after the war, some of the remains are of the dragon's teeth, these sharp metal spikes, which uh, still get exposed uh, at, uh, at low tide from time to time. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the sort of scaffold behind where uh, barbed wire was wrapped around. Uh, and this was designed to, to stop troops uh, from landing. Um, and then immediately in land of that, uh, a line of concrete uh, blocks uh, were, uh, were were installed to stop the, uh, the tanks from landing. Um, and these Concrete tank traps are still uh, visible on a lot of the, the beach at Minsmere, um, and it's one of the few places on the Suffolk coast where um, they still exist. There was a third measure uh, put in place to, to protect Minsmere's uh, habitats, uh, sorry, Minsmere uh, uh, from invasion, um, and that was to open up the sluice uh, and flood uh, the low lying land um, inland. And, and we'll come on to that uh, shortly as to why that was so significant to the uh, uh the, the future of what became uh, RSPB Minsmere. But we became uh, an RSPB Nature Reserve um, in April 1947. Um, and here you can see some of the pioneering uh, uh, people involved uh, at the time. Obviously male dominated uh, back then, um, but uh, uh, you'll see the equipment has changed a little as well. Um, and uh, uh, we don't see so many su suits and ties uh, on the reserve these days. Um, in this photo, you can see Eric Hosking, the pioneer um, wildlife photographer, uh, and uh, uh, the some of the early wardens at Minsmere. Throughout Minsmere's history, we've been a pioneering site. And one of the first things that we pioneered, really, was the use um, of, of birdwatching hides. Um, back then, some of them were rather ramshackle and... Uh, uh, built to uh, uh, just, just from some of the uh, the debris washed up on the shore, uh, and sometimes we even asked you to bring a, bring along your own hide. Um, but for those who have been to Minsmere, um, you'll know that fortunately our facilities have in, improved greatly since then. For the first thirty years uh, that Minsmere um, was in existence uh, as an RSPB reserve, we simply had a management agreement with the uh, Ogilvy Estate at Scotts Hall um, to manage about 1500 acres uh, of land and then in 1977 the opportunity came uh, for the RSPB to purchase uh, that 1500 acres um, so uh, a, an appeal went out to our members uh, some of you may uh, have been uh, members uh, way back uh, in, 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 in 1977 this is just a few weeks before I joined the, uh, the YOC our junior membership uh, myself uh, but this mem mailing went out uh, requesting uh, members to help to fund uh, the £240,000 that was required to buy 1,500 acres uh, at Minsmere. Uh, anyone who knows anything about uh, land prices these days will know that uh, that sort of money will only buy you a handful of acres these days. Uh, but we were successful. We bought the reserve um, and uh, uh, established it uh, very much uh, as the, uh, yeah, the foremost nature reserve in the country. We've subsequently expanded the site um, and we now uh, cover about two and a half thousand acres, um, that's a thousand hectares, um, so in World Cup parlance about a thousand football pitches um, uh, and it's a, a very varied site. Uh, when you do visit you'll have been on the reserve for two miles by the time you even reach the car park. And it's that longevity of 75 years of conservation management um, the location on the east coast um, in a migration uh, flyway, uh, the variety of habitats and the, in English terms at least, uh, 
size of the site, combined with the continu- uh, continuity of, uh, of habitats along the coast, as uh, yeah, Minsmere is just one of a number of co- almost contiguous uh, nature reserves around the East Anglian coast. Um, and that has helped Minsmere to become the most biodiverse RSPB reserve in the country, with a, a population, a, a, a variety of species um, already exceeding six and a half thousand different species. Uh, less than 300 of those are birds, so we're very far from being the bird reserve that the media will often refer to us as. Um, and visitors have always been key to Minsmith's history, even though if you read some of Bert Axel's early uh, annual reports from the 1960s, uh, uh, he refers to the impossibly large numbers of visitors that were coming to, uh, to visit the reserve. Uh, when he talks about 600 visitors per year, on a May bank holiday weekend, we could be pushing a thousand visitors per day now. Um, so times have changed very much. Um, but this is my first memory of Minsmere. This is the, the car park that anyone would have parked in when they arrived um, up until um, the mid 1990s. Um, the uh, small uh, visitor center just on the, uh, the, the, the bank on the right um, and the warden's uh, accommodation uh, up on the top. I first uh, stayed in the Volunteer Chalet when it was located uh, in uh, up there. Um, but by the mid-90s, demand for visiting Minsmere um, and for birdwatching in general had exceeded the capacity of the site. Um, and so we built uh, a new visitor centre uh, and a new car park, much larger car park giving um, greater capacity um, and allowing more and more visitors to come um, and then to come down and to enjoy um, the visitor centre, which opened in 1996 with a, a fantastic shop and cafe. Uh, but by the time I joined the, the, the team um, in January 2003, uh, the visitor centre was already deemed not fit for purpose. Um, and we started um, what turned out to be um, uh, almost 10 years of fundraising um, to uh, create a project that allowed us to upgrade our facilities even further, um, including building this uh, reception building onto the front, expanding the shop. Um, anyone who's been to uh, any of the RSPB reserves will, will know that you know, our shops uh, stock a fantastic range uh, of gifts and uh, uh, bird watching equipment, uh, Christmas cards and the like, um, and some extremely well uh, uh, trained and knowledgeable staff um, helping to ensure that you get the, the, the best products for you, for your birds uh, and for your hobby. Uh, and then, of course, you'll head through into the cafe. Say, say from personal experience, all of the cakes are fantastic. Um, the sausage rolls, if you try them, it's a meal in itself. Um, and the cheese scones are to die for. Uh, yeah, they Forget the National Trust. These are the best cheese scones you'll find anywhere in Suffolk. Um, and uh, uh, probably in the UK, uh, unless, of course, you make your own, in which case I'm sure they're better. But your journey around uh, Minsmere uh, will start, um, with, in terms of watching the wildlife, right at the visitor centre. Uh, and if you're very, very lucky, you might find uh, one of these. This is a really special creature. It's, it's nocturnal, so we don't tend to see the adults very often. Um, this is an, an adult antlion. Um, and prior to um, the construction of the visitor centre, antlions were virtually unknown uh, in the UK. Um, but in 1996, uh, what, uh, an entomologist stay, staying on the reserve discovered some of these shallow conical pits uh, and he immediately recognized them uh, as being the larval burrows of uh, the uh, of the antlion um, and it confirmed that for the first time antlions were nesting um, in the UK so uh, uh, at the bottom of that pit will lie the larva that's what the larva looks like um, and it's about the size of, uh, of my, my small fingernail um, and it's sitting in the bottom of that pit waiting for an unsuspecting ant, or as you can see in this picture, woodlouse to fall in. Um, and then as they scramble to try and get back out of the soft sand, um, the vibrations alert the antlion larva, and it flicks grains of sand uh, at, the, uh, at the ant to pull it back down into those massive pincers. Uh, and eventually uh, the larva will emerge um, as the adult, uh, which on the reserve we tend to see most frequently when, when we run a moth trap. Um, um, they're attracted to the light. Uh, otherwise, uh, you'd be very lucky to see them. But the larval pits can be seen um, throughout the year, literally alongside uh, the back of the visitor reception. Just a 
short distance uh, along the trails, uh, you can sit down or, or even sitting outside the cafe um, and watch our sand martins during the spring uh, and summer months as they, uh, they nest in the burrows um, around the, the pond. Um, and this, for those who uh, do uh, remember the, the old car park, yeah, this is where the old car park was. Um, so this was excavated in the late 1990s, uh, and it's a fantastic place um, to sit and watch, um, not just to watch the San Martins uh, overhead, um, but if you're very lucky, um, you'll see water vole, maybe even a water shrew. They've been uh, regularly seen down there uh, in recent years, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and a variety of, uh, of, of insects. In the spring, particularly in, in March and April, um, the area below the San Martin Bank is also a good place to look for adders. Um, and our, our volunteers are fantastic at uh, tracking down uh, basking adders uh, during March and April. Um, and uh, we'll spend as long as possible uh, watching them, showing them to, uh, to, to you uh, as, as visitors. So if you do want to see an adder, um, I would definitely recommend a visit in the sort of second half of March, first half of April, uh and getting in as you know, as early in the morning as possible uh because if it warms up a little bit too much they'll they'll be out uh, hunting uh, and by the middle of april the the females will emerge from hibernation and then you may get the the courtship dances just another 100 yards along the path um if you visit us during during the summer months during sort of june july and august um you'll encounter a section of the path that we nicknamed digger alley Digger Alley is so called because it is home to um, probably 30 to 40 different species of digger wasps, mining bees and other mining um, insects. Um, and this is possibly the most famous of them. Uh, this is the bee wolf. And you can see in this photo, uh, it is uh, carrying beneath it a uh, honeybee um, that it's going to have caught somewhere out on the trails, uh, maybe as much as a mile away carry the honeybee slung under its body back to its burrow. The female uh, bee wolf will then uh, re-excavate the entrance hole, which it, be which it closed as it left, um, and take the, the, larva, uh, take the, the bee up to a metre below ground. She'll then lay her eggs in the burrow, and the, when the eggs hatch, they will eat the, uh, the, 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 the honeybee um, and develop it into next, the next generation of bee wolves. It's important to note that that bee is not dead. It's only paralysed. It's, it's important that it's only paralysed because then it doesn't rot uh, and it will continue to provide food for the developing bee wolf larva. Now, outside that bee wolf burrow, there may be waiting uh, a ruby-tailed wasp, um, waiting for the chance to sneak into the burrow to lay its eggs in the developing bee wolf larva um, for its eggs to eat, its larva to eat the bee wolf larva. So, You've got parasites parasitizing parasites um, literally underneath your feet. And you can watch the comings and goings um, throughout the, the summer months. Um, um, and if it plays, um, we have a fantastic little video here. Let me just see whether this will play, which will tell you a lot more about the bee wolf. In the summer, along Digger Alley at RSPB Minsmere, you can see the can people you hit, garden can some, meter Andrew, can you hear that? Her morning ablutions. She's a type of digger wasp. Yes, I can, Ian. Yeah, no worries. When it's nice and warm, she will leave the burrow, closing the door behind her. She's hunting honeybees, carrying them back underneath her. Bees are only paralysed so they stay fresh and juicy for her larvae, up to five at a time in each chamber of her nest. By the end of the season, she would stock 30 chambers with bees, each one cleaned, protected with an antibiotic and an antifungal secretion. The adults live off nectar and are pollinators in their own right. Disagreements do sometimes occur, but they're normally settled with a quick conversation using the antenna. It is the females that do all the work, but the much smaller males are here too. This one is taking a little rest in his little man cave. Rather than fighting the right to mate, males have a pheromone-based neck. In the world of bee wolf, 
the nicest smelling chaps get the girls. The beef wolf finds its burrow by memorising the local landmarks and confirming it is hers with her pheromones. The season is short, typically they live for only six weeks or so during July and August, but during that time they fascinate us all. So that was, uh, video was put together by two of our volunteers um, who uh, will spend much of their time uh, uh, watching those fascinating creatures and showing them to uh, visitors during the summer months. Uh, but it's not just the bee wolves down there. Um, there's bees as well. This is a stunning green eyed flower bee um, and uh, a whole variety of other insects that, um, that, that, that will just provide hours of fun. And yeah, you can you can quite easily while away an hour. Um, with your mobile phone um, or macro lens um, taking footage of these fascinating insects. But the same area where we've got Digger Alley, um, it, other times of the year, um, is a great place to, for, for migrant warblers be, um, coming and breeding in the summer, in a, yeah, spring and summer, or, or, or refueling on blackberries later in the year. Uh, lovely uh, uh, black cap here. Um, and then you'll wander out um, onto the uh, the, the the first part of the wetlands and walk along the north wall, which is a, a raised uh, sea defence bank separating um, the most vulnerable part of our reed bed um, to the right in the picture here, uh, North Marsh from um, the rest of the freshwater habitats. And should the sea breach um, the dunes at some point in the future, um, the sluice um, that's about in the location where this photo is taken from um, can be closed off to um, allow North Marsh to uh, become more brackish uh, whilst protecting the freshwater integrity of the rest of the reserve. Um, this is the North Marsh. I'm um, looking north to the National Trust Coast Guard's cottages, the white buildings uh, on the, uh, the hill there at Dunwich Heath. Um, and this can be a great place to look for bearded tits, uh, for marsh harriers um, and for bittens uh, during uh, all, well, all year round. Um, just walking along there today, I had both marsh harrier and bearded tit, for example. At the end of the north wall, you head down onto the beach, uh, and uh, you can see here some of the, the, the remains of the war uh, time defences that have been exposed uh, by the uh, rap rapid erosion on this uh, stretch of coast. But the, the vegetated shingle beach is, uh, is one of our most important habitats. Um, globally, vegetated shingle um, only occurs in just a handful of places, um, and the UK um, is the most important uh, uh, place to find them. Places like the Suffolk coast from from Lowestoft down to Shingle Street, um, the Dungeness Peninsula in Kent and, 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 and Spurn Point um, and Chisel Beach um, really hold the majority of, of this valuable habitat. Uh, important for species like sea pea um, and, and sea holly, uh, yellowhorn poppy, um, and of course where you've got the flowers, you've got the burnet moths and butterflies coming in as well. But I mentioned Minsmere is a very, very varied site, um, and on this aerial photo you can see um, just on the, the, the right hand side below the logo, you can see the, uh, um, the car park uh, and then in the, the, the foreground of the picture um, is the scrape, which we're going to talk about next. Um, behind that, the large area of reed bed. Um, to the left, just off the, uh, off the left hand side of this picture is coastal grazing marshes um, and to the north, so the northwest, um, uh, the sort of right hand end, top right hand end of the picture, woodland and then beyond that heathland. Uh, we're going to come to all of those habitats in turn as we go through the talk. But we'll start with the scrape. Uh, and the scrape is what it says on the can. It is a shallow scrape in the ground. It is a man-made habitat. It was created in the early 1960s by our pioneering warden, Bert Axel, uh, to create um, a purpose-built habitat for wading birds um, and, uh, and nesting terns. Um, and... Uh, uh, to try to replicate a coastal uh, uh, brackish lagoon. <clears throat> uh, and the most important part of the, uh, uh, of the scrape is that we're able to manage it uh, for a variety of different species throughout the year. Uh, anyone who's been uh, to Minsmere uh, will know that the, the, often the best hide to view the scrape from is the east hide. But one of the difficulties with the East Tide um, has been actually getting to it. It was only accessible via the beach and some steps. Um, and of course, for a large proportion of our visitors, that's been 
um, a, a, a difficult uh, uh, situation. So we're really pleased that uh, literally in the last couple of weeks, we've been op- able to open up this fantastic 450 metre long boardwalk um, that ensures that all visitors um, are now able to reach uh, the East Hyde um, and get some amazing views uh, of the Scopes wildlife. Uh, the, the East Hyde itself has been expanded as well to uh, to allow for greater capacity. Apologies, I literally put that, th- those two slides in this morning and just dropped them in slightly in the wrong place in the talk, so I'll, um, just apologies there. Uh, this, is th- this is the scrape, uh, the, uh, the, the, the what it looks like, or what it looked like just a couple, few years ago. Um, you can see a digger out at work there. You've got the, the Brackish uh, Lagoon and, and islands out there. Um, but 10, 15 years or so ago, we realised that uh, we could make it a lot better for visitors as well as for wildlife. And with some simple management um, and reprofiling, taking away some of this bank that's immediately in front of the, uh, uh, of the hide here, uh, we could bring the wildlife much, much closer, bringing uh, waders right in front of the hide, um, and uh, so if you visit Minsmere um, at any time of year, um, you should be able to see a great variety of, of birds out there. If you came during the summer this year, you'd have seen a desert, unfortunately. Um, it was so dry. Um, but that did allow us to go back out with our um, contractors and do some more reprofiling and change the, the layout of the scrape uh, again to benefit uh, the, the variety of wild, wildlife that can be found there. The most uh, well-known of which, of course, is the Avocet. It's the bird on the RSPB's logo, and uh, uh, it is uh, a bird which uh, really owes uh, its existence in the UK um, to Minsmere. If we go back right to the beginning of the talk, and I talked about the, the defences put in place during the war, I mentioned that the, the land was flooded um, to create a, a shallow barrier uh, lake uh, to stop in, in, invasion. After the war, when the sluice was operational again, um, the water levels receded, they were left behind a series of shallow pools. Um, and on those pools in April 1947, uh, local bird watchers found four pairs of nesting avocets and launched Operation Zebra to protect these incredibly beautiful black and white birds. Those nests were actually found just a few weeks before the RSPB um, signed uh, the management agreement, but uh, we had planned to do uh, to sign that anyway. It wasn't simply because of the Avocets. Avocets nested successfully at Minsmere in 1947, uh, and also just down the coast on Havergate Island, which became an RSPB reserve the following year. Um, and that was the first time that they'd nested anywhere in the UK um, for more than 100 years. Following that initial success, unfortunately, they disappeared again from Minsmere because those pools that had been left after the war had started to dry out and vegetate over. And it wasn't until Burke created the scrape in 1963, the Avocets came back to nest um, again immediately um, and have continued to do so uh, every year since. It's not just Avocets that you can find in terms of waders on the scrape, um, especially if you come during migration period. So um, April and May, um, we'll get a wide variety of migrants heading north. And then from about Midsummer's Day, um, they'll start heading back south. And then you can look out for these stunning summer plumage spotted red shanks. Um, and probably July and August are the peak months for wader migration on the reserve. Um, as well as birds like spotted red shank, there'll be good numbers of rough and green and wood sandpipers, uh, black tailed godwits, um, and often some scarcities mix- mixed in with them. Things like marsh sandpiper or pectoral sandpiper, white rump sandpiper have all occurred in recent years. The scrape isn't just for waders, though. There's a huge colony of black-headed gulls out there. Um, it has exceeded 3,000 pairs, um, although we didn't have quite so many there out there this year. Um, you can see this one we nicknamed Newton um, because he used to sit in the, in the pond um, eating the smooth newts that the uh, kids love to catch from the pond dipping sessions. Uh, but uh, uh, amongst those gulls, um, look carefully. Uh, you, you, you've got a good chance in particularly March to May um, of finding a black-headed gull. Um, and I, I say that deliberately because the black-headed gull isn't black-headed. The black-headed gull is actually chocolate brown-headed gull. The black-headed gull, Laurus melanocephalus, um, is actually um, better known to us probably as the Mediterranean gull, um, a, a really sexy gull. Whether or not you like gulls, um, if there's a med gull around, 
you need to you need to look for them. It's lovely jet black head, bright red bill, uh, dark red legs. Um, and in adult birds like this one, absolutely clean white wingtips, no black in the wingtips. Um, and overhead, um, you'll hear a cat-like call uh, uh, amongst the, the raucous calls of the black-headed gulls. Now, I mentioned that the, the scrape um, is a man-made habitat, and it was the first of its kind in the world. It's a habitat that's now been created on virtually every wetland nature reserve uh, in the UK and wider uh, afield. Bert Axel himself headed to places as far afield as China and Australia to, uh, to create wader scrapes. Um, but when it was first created at Minsmere, one of the dilemmas was how to um, ensure that the nutrient cycling was able to continue to happen, um, that you would naturally get by a process of vegetation, vegetation developing, and then the site flooding with salt water, killing off the vegetation and putting the nutrients back into the system. We tried to replicate that in an artificial way. Um, and in the early 60s, one of the, one of the ideas was to bring in the, the fish that had been caught in the inlet grill of the Sizewell nuclear power station, um, Sizewell A, that had just been built um, back then. Um, and to bury those fish um, on the island. So as they rotted down, it would put nutrients into the system, feed the invertebrates that were going to feed the avocets. All great in principle. Unfortunately, um, one of the consequences of burying that much dead fish on the scrape was it attracted rats, um, and the rats came in and uh, ate the eggs of the sandwich terns, and we lost um, the sandwich tern colony at Minsmere. Uh, until a few years ago, when they came back, and we've had several hundred pairs um, of sandwich terns nesting um, out on the scrape again, in recent years, uh, along with good numbers of common terns. Um, and during migration times, there'll often be an Arctic or black tern, or maybe, maybe even a roseate tern mixed in. And if you're very lucky, um, you might find nesting little terns. They used to nest on the beach, uh, but the erosion has changed the profile of the beach. Uh, and in recent years, uh, uh, we have had some nesting attempts actually on uh, the scrape itself. I've already mentioned that we tried to replicate natural processes and this year the whole scrape dried out but even in a normal year we would try to try to dry out small parts of the scrape so that we can rotate the vegetation in um, turn it over and uh, and try and get uh, um, a, a cycling of, of the nutrients. Having left East Tide and head down up onto the beach and carry on along the beach until we get to the sluice. Um, this is the structure that was uh, uh, opened up to uh, to flood the land during the war um, and at this point you have three choices. Um, you can take a path to the right that will lead you back into the reserve around the rest of the scrape. You can take a path straight on, um, which will head um, down uh, back towards Eastbridge and the Eelsfoot pub. Uh, uh, or you can take a path to the left um, and ha explore uh, the, the migrant hotspot that is the sluice bushes um, and then look out across the grazing marshes. Um, you should also pause for a while in the spring um, around the sluice uh, and look out for the swallows, which uh, well, certainly used to nest in the sluice structure. They've been absent the last couple of years, but uh, uh, hopefully they'll return and nest in there again because they were always extremely obliging in terms of photographs. If you take the middle one of those paths heading straight towards Eastbridge, you can detour up to uh, uh, the scheduled ancient monument that is Layston Abbey, um, the remains of the 12th century uh, chapel uh, from the original Leyston Abbey um, that was demolished in the, in, in the 14th century to move uh, the whole structure uh, a couple of miles inland and build, rebuild the abbey as a consequence of the, of the surrounding land flooding too frequently. What was left behind was the, the chapel, which is consecrated ground um, and is a scheduled ancient monument that the RSPB is responsible for. During the Second World War, uh, this pillbox was built in the in the middle of the uh, uh the abbey as well um so we actually have responsibility for two scheduled ancient monuments in one uh and uh yeah subtly camouflaged pillbox there but it is well worth walking up to uh to look at the chapel um because we also have an art installation up there it was put in a few years ago a um, lovely bit of stained glass that a local artist uh, constructed um deliberately to put uh into the uh the old chapel from the chapel field, you can also scan out across the levels or you can head down along the dunes and look across the, the grazing marsh um, where you know, the summer months of cattle are grazing. Um, in the spring, you'll have breeding lapwing um, and, and red shank out there. And in the winter months, large flocks of ducks and geese. Um, maybe the odd hooper um, or Buick swan, um, either out there or on some of the pools within the reed bed. 
Um, this year, very unusually, we had a single Hooper Swan with us from mid-July onwards. So uh, um, obviously a bird that had got injured in the spring and hadn't migrated. So we, we had one with us throughout the summer. Um, the area around the sluice is also a great place to look for our, our four-legged wardens. Um, these are our conic Polskis or Polish ponies. Um, the, an, an ancient breed recreated to create um, as, as close as possible to the tarpan, which is the wild horse uh, of ancient Europe. Uh, very, very hardy animals, quite happy in conditions like this. Um, this isn't a recent photo. We haven't had snow, um, just very heavy frost um, this week. Um, but uh, yeah, they're quite happy out there. Um, if they were out in Poland at this time of year, they'd be in, in a foot or more of snow um, and, and more than happy managing out there. We're now going to head back in um, alongside the, the rest of the scrape and look out across the reed bed um, and loop round onto the other trails. Um, to look out across uh, one of the most important freshwater reed beds in the country. Home, in particular, um, to uh, uh, well three of Minsmere's big five species. I've already mentioned one of the big five, the Avocet. Um, three of the other big five species at Minsmere all occur in our, our reed beds. And this is one of them, the bittern, um, a bird that uh, was on the verge of extinction uh, when the RSPB um, started doing some uh, research um, into why they were declining and what their requirements were in the 1980s. Uh, we fitted some birds with satellite tags, or oh, sorry, radio tags in those days, and our wardens walked around the reserve with uh, TV aerials, tracking where the bitterns were, which showed that the, what, what the bitterns required was um, nice wet edges um, and pools within the reed bed. Um, and reed beds naturally dry out. So if you're not managing uh, a reed bed, it will... It will ultimately be aiming to become uh, a, a wet woodland. Um, so with EU funding, uh, we uh, carried out a three-year programme of re-wetting the reed bed, taking out up to a metre of peat um, and uh, creating new pools and ditches uh, because you know, the alternative was to raise the water level, but that would have flooded the valley. So instead of raising the water level, we, had, we lowered the soil levels. It looks quite destructive at the time, but within just a, a, a matter of uh, months, um, the reed bed is re-establishing um, and uh, yeah, we've uh, had great success in turning around the fortunes of, of the Bittens um, at Minsmere and by copying um, the, uh, the work that we've done at Minsmere um, at other sites, um, yeah, the Bitten population is very much on the up. From a low of just 11 males in the whole of the UK in 1997, by which time the population at Minsmere was already starting to increase. Um, we have about 250 males throughout the UK now. Um, so a real success story. Um, and the ongoing management um, within the reed bed um, does require our wardens uh, to get out there and brush cut small patches each year. Uh, we tend to cut it on about a seven to 10 year rotation. You can see um, Katie uh, and um, uh, Laura here um, out in the reed bed with brush cutters. Um, and then um, our wardens and volunteers will burn um, the cut reed. Uh, because we're cutting on a seven to ten year rotation, um, it's not suitable to use for, for reed for thatch, uh, which is cut on a, an annual rotation and much, much later in the winter at a time of year when we want the water levels nice and high uh, for the breeding season to start. Um, so we, we burn the, um, the, the cut reed uh, so that we don't get a buildup of, uh, of sediment uh, and, uh, and vegetation uh, and we can keep the reed bed nice and, and wet and open. And in some of the wetter bits, uh, we, we uh, hire in uh, the chuck saw. Um, this is a, 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 an amphibious reed cutting machine um, that will cut and, uh, and scoop up uh, large quantities of reed um, and allow us to keep some of the pools nice and open as well. Uh, and if you come in January, February, there's a good chance you'll see this machine in action out in the reed bed. Of course, with all this uh, fantastic reed bed wildlife we need to make sure that you can get to see it as well so uh, we have a couple of amazing hides that look out over the reed bed bitten hide uh, which was built uh, about 25 years ago on the site of one of the original uh, hides at Minsmere uh, it was raised up about five meters above the reed bed and the views from there are absolutely spectacular um, um, even better is the island mere hide um, this uh, lovely hide replaced an old dark damp wooden hide um, that had been uh, um, it, in place since the 70s. Um, uh, and when we when we built this new hide in 2011, we had a lot of 
negative feedback from our, our local bird watchers who said, well, those big windows, you're going to scare away all the wildlife. You're not going to see anything from in front of there. We said to them, no, we don't believe you. You know, we're confident it's going to work. Um, yeah, the, the, the guys who were building the hide were often seeing bitterns um, out in the Rebo whilst they were building it. The wildlife will, will, will get used to it. Um, and so it's proved um, because uh, the bitterns will often be so close to the hide that you only need uh, a, digit, uh, a mobile phone uh, in order to take your photos. Um, uh, the volunteer who put together that Bee Wolf video earlier uh, has often referred to Minsmere's bittens as pesky bittens because they're they're too close for them to use this 600 mil lens uh from the hide um and uh not just the bittens but otters as well um regularly seen and um after after being absent really for a couple of years uh, they've started to be showing again um quite a lot in the last few weeks so uh, you've got a good chance um again over the winter months especially of seeing an otter if you visit minsmere um, um and two more of minsmere's big five species, the bearded tit, which back in 1975, uh, 1947, sorry, when we acquired uh, Minsmere, was down to just four pairs in the whole of the UK, all at Minsmere, uh, now thriving in rebeds throughout the UK and, of course, um, even in, um, in central London, uh, at the wet London Wetland Centre. Um, and likewise, Marsh Harriers, 1971, just a single pair had survived the drainage of our wetlands and the impacts of DDT. Um, and that pair at Minsmere, um, boosted by in, in, immigrants from, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, has helped to boost the population to the levels um, that Ma marsh harries are now in excess of 500 pairs in the UK and nesting as far north as Orkney um, and almost taken for granted now by us. Uh, we have to remember to continue to point them out to uh, visitors who are coming to look for these spectacular birds. Just going back to the hide, one of the things that we found as we started talking to the bird watchers who complained about this this fantastic hide was what they really meant when they said that you, you've ruined it was not that we weren't going to see any wildlife. What they really meant was that they couldn't sit in the dark top right hand corner of that dark damp hide where they couldn't talk to anyone else. Uh, and they could be sitting there in, in silence and hiding this new hide meant they didn't have that option. They had to talk to other people. God forbid bird watchers talking to each other. Uh, but of course, with uh, our expanding team of volunteer guides, that was exactly what we wanted because talking to each other is the best way to share um, experiences. And I've sat in that hide um, in a, a winter evening um, watching 30,000 starlings coming into roost in front of the hide um, and the whole hide full of people erupting in applause as the starlings disappeared down into the, the reeds in front of us. And the bitten standing in front of us going, well, I'm still here um, as uh, uh, taking absolutely no notice of 50 people clapping um, simultaneously in the hide. Of course, our reed beds are important for a whole host of other species as well, um, including uh, a range of dragonflies, some of which are recent colonists. So this is a, a Norfolk corker. Um, I mentioned earlier the black headed gull is badly named. Well, the Norfolk corker is badly named these days because they're not confined to the Norfolk broads. Uh, anymore they're much much more widespread than that and we probably should adopt the the continental name of green eyed hawker with those massive green eyes that are really distinctive um, and uh, norfolk hawkers have been breeding at minsbury now for um, 10 plus years um, we've also got uh, an, another recent colonist the willow emerald damselfly first found nesting in britain within the last 10 years on the suffolk coast uh, and again now spreading to much of southeastern england um so uh, um a whole host of new species coming in um, and new birds coming in as well. Great white egrets. Um, I remember just a couple of months after I started working at Minsmere, um, doing an interview with Leslie Dolphin from BBC Radio Suffolk um, in one of the hides. Um, and she turned around and said, so what's that big white bird out there? Um, and we looked out and there's a great white egret sit sitting in the bush behind the hide. Uh, we radioed back to the visitor center and all the wardens came charging into the hide to twitch what, 20 years ago was still a rare bird. Um, uh, now we see great white egrets virtually daily at Minsmere. Of course, they're nesting good numbers down in the Somerset levels and a few other places. Um, and uh, over the last few months, we've had up to seven birds um, throughout uh, throughout the, uh, the, the summer. So it's only a matter of time, I think, before great white egrets are joining um, the other uh, herons uh, that are breeding um, on the Suffolk coast. 
Um, and although not a heron, a heron-like bird, um, great news um, in the last few weeks um, about common cranes, which um, uh, we, uh, I've had this, th this slide in for a few years saying have been nesting at a secret site on the Suffolk coast. Um, we can confirm that they nested just down the coast at Snape, where we have a new wetland, um, and nested successfully for the first time ever on the Suffolk coast um, this summer. Um, and we've had uh, a couple of birds prospecting territory at Minsmere uh, in recent years as well. So maybe one day we'll soon we'll we'll have common cranes nesting with us as well. Maybe even glossy ibis. We had up to five glossy ibises throughout the spring, um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's there's regularly birds around uh, almost any time of year now. So uh, another bird that is almost certainly going to be uh, following the other herons and colonising uh, more of the UK in recent uh, in, in coming years. And then you get the real rarities. Um, and I'm still talking about the reed bed here. So why am I showing a photo of a black browed albatross? Well, some of you might know this story, um, but back in uh, 2000 and what are we, 2014, 2016, um, we, um, no, 2015, sorry, uh, one of our wardens was coming back uh, from a walk around the scrape in. Uh, late July, um, got caught in a thunderstorm, dived into South Hyde, um, thinking late July, thunderstorm, good chance of some migrant waders dropping in. Little did he know as he looked out of the back of the hide at a small pool within the reed bed um, that he was going to spot a black brad albatross sitting, swimming around in a reed bed pool with mute swans. Um, uh, and Quite why it was there is anyone's guess, um, but it was obviously the bird that had been spending um, the previous few summers over on the German coast in amongst an uh, a gannet colony uh, and got caught in that storm. Uh, by the time he put the news out um, and our site manager was desperately trying to work out how to get um, out to see it when, when he had to be back to lock the visitor centre up um, in, in 10 minutes. Uh, by the time uh, he'd sorted out the arrangements, the bird had already flown, was gone out to sea and not seen again. Um, and just Ian, uh, our warden, and two two visitors um, who managed to get a photograph of, of that bird um, managed to see it. It's not this one. This is the one that uh, is up at, has been up at Bempton Cliffs for the last couple of years that uh, um, I was lucky enough to see up there. Um, so I missed the albatross, but exactly a year to the day later, um, a big blue chicken was found in exactly the same pool. Swampy. This is a western purple swamp hen or western swamp hen. Um, formerly known as Purple Gallinule, um, and this was the first of its kind um, accepted as a wild bird um, in the UK. Um, and it turned up on exactly that same pool. It spent a week there showing to, uh, to, to all visitors um, and, uh, uh, and then headed up to Lincolnshire where it spent the rest of the year. Unfortunately for our senior site manager at the time, um, who had failed to see that albatross because he was trying to work out how to get from the visitor centre. He was in the Netherlands for the whole of this bird's stay um, at Minsmere. Uh, and so the pool concerned um, became known as Roland's Pool of Despair. Um, we much prefer uh, the line, the, the, pool, the pool of dreams these days because the you know, lightning has already struck twice. There's got to be something rare um, due to turn up again in that same pool. Well, certainly, we don't just pass it by um, uh, without giving it at least a, a cursory glance anymore. But it's time to move away from the wetlands uh, and head to our drier habitats. Uh, but before we do so, um, just a, a passing reference to, to this building that appeared um, up on the, the hill behind uh, Island Mere Hyde in the spring uh, of 2014 and had um, lots of people saying, what's the, what's the, what's the building? A spring watch coming. Um, and our response had to be, well, the BBC have built the building, but we don't really know what they're doing. They're, they're planning some sort of programme, but we don't know what. Because until two weeks before Springwatch went on air, it was embargoed, and we weren't actually allowed to admit that they were going to be coming. Um, but for three consecutive springs, um, we were treated some to um, the spectacular wildlife uh, that, we, that, that uh, uh, is present at Minsmere being broadcast across our, our screens uh, and uh, uh, able to share... Uh, some amazing experiences and we learned an awful lot from the team um, and it was a pleasure working with the Springwatch team. It was amazing to think that um, they had uh, you know, 
miles and miles and miles of cabling around the reserve for all the cameras, and yet most people wouldn't have seen any of it there. Um, within 12 hours of the, the final broadcast going off air in 2016, um, the, um, uh, some of the cabling was en route uh, to uh, the World Cup uh, in, um, sorry, in 2014, one, one route to the World Cup in Brazil. Um, and within two days, uh, it was all, the rest of the equipment was all en route to Glastonbury. They clear away as quickly as that. Uh, but it was fascinating to see. Um, uh, unfortunately, the building itself had to be taken down after Springwatch had finished with us because uh, um, didn't have electricity, didn't have water. So all we could really do with it was, was have it as a, you know, a a wet weather shelter. We couldn't really use it for education groups or for um, uh, you know, for catering or anything like that without spending a huge amount of money. Um, so um, the, the the building is no no longer there, uh, but uh, the legacy of Springwatch is because the platform is still in place, and um, uh, we will um, eventually um, open that up to visitors as a, an additional viewing area as well. Uh, immediately across the road from the Springwatch platform, um, you head into the woods and you you can come across some of the most spectacular bluebell woods um, in Suffolk during May. One of the advantages of our bluebells is they tend to come out about two weeks later than most of the other woodlands in Suffolk. So uh, where most people will be watching the bluebells through May, ours tend to come out late May and through June. Um, so you get that, uh, that wonderful aroma of hyacinth um, through uh, the late spring months. And overhead, hopefully... Um, you can hear um, the, 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 the melodic song of Nightingale. Um, this year, uh, for the first time in a few years, we actually had Nightingale singing outside the office window at the entrance to the car park. Uh, but if they're not singing there, usually the best place to go is just ahead uh, a couple of miles north to the edge of the reserve around Westleton Heath um, and, and, and listen to Nightingales. You only have about six weeks of the year in, in, in order to hear a Nightingale from mid-April to the end of May. Another of the stars of Spring Watch were our stoats, um, which we often see around the car park um, and sometimes uh, around the hides. Um, and for those who remember Spring Watch, the super mum uh, stoat who uh, moved her, her, her litter of kits um, around the reserve, ultimately setting up home in the car park, um, was filmed um, climbing about 30 feet up an oak tree and removing a whole brood of soon to fledged green woodpecker chicks uh, from the nest um, to feed to her hu hungry litter. Uh, as well as um, the variety of uh, uh, of birds uh, and mammals around the reserve, um, Innsmere is home to a huge variety of, uh, of moths. Uh, more than a thousand different species of moths have been found on the reserve. Um, and every um, month we try to run a moth uh, uh, event uh, where we, we open the traps for visitors in the morning. Um, and you can come and, uh, uh, and join us as we open the traps. Uh, and sometimes if we catch something really spectacular, like an elephant hawk moth, uh, we might leave it in, on display in a visitor centre for an hour or so as well for, for other visitors to see. Um, the, the moth that's inset in the bottom right here is a, one that you probably won't see at Minsmere. Um, it's only ever been recorded once in the UK. That was at Minsmere on the reserve um, uh, back in, in 2005 when, uh, when, when one was caught in our trap. Uh, and being the first British record, um, our wardens were able to name it. Uh, and that is named still and, uh, and appears in moth field guides as the Minsmere Crimson Underwing, the only animal currently named after an RSPB nature reserve. And still the only one actually recorded in the UK. So you head down to southeast, southeastern Europe and you might find Minsmere Crimson Underwing uh, down there. We're going to continue further north, right up to the edge, northern edge of the reserve, up to Wesselton Heath. Um, home to um, a spectacular range of, of heathland flora, including um, three different species of, uh, of gorse and three different species of, uh, of heather, um, and, um, and also uh, a thriving population of Dartford warblers, a bird that disappeared from the Suffolk coast in the 60s um, and came back um, with the warmer summers in the mid-90s um, and is, is, is really thriving. Um, and in recent years, we've had a couple of pairs nesting in the dunes uh, as well. So uh, um, uh, a, a great bird to look out for. Um, and of course, on an evening visit uh, in the summer uh, to look and listen out for, for Nightjar. Um, and uh, I should be able to play a sound on this one. Just bear with me because my your pictures are all in the... 
Wrong place. Where's my sound recording gone? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had a sound recording there. I don't seem to be able to see the link. Um, wonderful sound. If, you do, if you've never heard a night jar, come along to Minsmere in, in June. Head out onto the heath at dusk uh, and listen for that, for that mechanical sound. Um, also, look out for things like woodlark out on the heath um, uh, and, uh, uh, and other wildlife like adders uh, and, uh, and stone chats and yellow hammers. Uh, and uh, one of the, the most spectacular um, birds that we have on the reserve, um, the stone curlew, goggle-eyed plover, wailing heath chicken, Eurasian thick knee. Pick whichever name you like. Um, goggle-eyed plover is always uh, uh, the one I particularly like. These huge, great big yellow eyes. It is a wading bird, uh, but it doesn't like water. It likes very dry, sandy soil with, with lots of stones, short grass, rabbit grazed in particular um and, and in the uk the main populations are down on the uh the salisbury plain area um and in the brecks of uh, of the norfolk suffolk borders um but there's been a a small population on the suffolk coast um and we managed to get them back breeding at minsmere in 2003 um thanks to some major habitat restoration work and restoring um heathland habitat um to bring um these spectacular birds back we had 12 pairs of stone curlews nesting on the reserve this year. And if you do visit us during the spring, we do do our best to, to point you in the direction of where a pair is going to be viewable. They're really easy to, to disturb, um, but there is often a pair that is in a, a location where we can encourage you to go and, and watch them to reduce the disturbance to other birds. Um, the heath also has uh, a, 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 a big population of uh, silver studded blue butterflies. Uh, and, and this is a, a really special butterfly. Uh, like a lot of the blues, um, it it requires a particular species of ant in which to uh, 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 form a symbiotic relationship. The ant takes the caterpillars below ground and it milks them for the sugary secretions that they give out um, and feeds the caterpillars. Um, and uh, so the ants, uh, the, the, the butterflies would only occur um, on, on certain heathlands that have this particular uh, uh, ant species present. The big star attraction on the, the Heathland and the, particularly the arable reversion uh, areas um, and big in every sense of the word um, are, are red deer. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, one of the largest uh, herds of uh, wild red deer in the UK and probably one of the purest herds. There's no seeker deer mixed in with our red deer. So they're big, really big animals um, and 12, 14, even um, 16 point stags uh, are far from unknown. This one, if you count um, carefully, you can see a point um, is anything that you can get a wedding ring over. Um, so if you count carefully on the, the left hand antler as you look at it, there are actually seven points, um, five pointing upwards, one pointing off to the left, and you can just about pick out um, one uh, sort of pointing to the right off the bottom of the antler. Um, and there's uh, I think six points on the other side. So this is probably a this is technically a thirteen pointer. You, you would probably call it a fourteen pointer. Um, so what one of the bigger animals that we will see? And come to Minsmere during October, um, and you can often watch the rut from the public footpaths. Um, but if you really want to enjoy it uh, at its best, you need to book onto one of our Red Deer four by four tours um, that we run uh, for for three weeks during October, um, and we can get you much much closer to the deer. Um, I thought about arable reversion. What we've done with those areas is we, we, when we bought them, they were farmland, um, and we reverted that farmland back to um, uh, back to heathland by uh, cropping without uh, adding more nutrients, and then um, initially spreading with sulphur uh, to to reacidify the soil, and then allowing the acid grassland to take over, um, or in some cases spreading um, heather cuttings um, to encourage heathland to develop. Um, and uh, in other parts of the reserve, as here, removing self-sown birch and pine trees to restore uh, the heathland that was formerly present. Um, the Suffolk coastal heathlands are known as sandlings here, so on a very dry, sandy soil. Um, and they used to stretch almost continuously from, from uh, Ipswich down up to Lowestoft, but uh, just small pockets remain. So um, the more we can restore, um, the more we can benefit that heathland wildlife that we've just uh, been, been looking at. And then sometimes we'll run... Um, a, a special event. And this particular event, um, we hosted um, the first ever uh, Minsmere 
uh, Love Minsmere Festival in September 2015. So, so September 2019 um, uh, on Wind Hill um, as an event to uh, uh, launch our objections to the proposed building of Sizewell C um, power station. About 1,500 people came along. We formed this fantastic uh, um, heart um, that uh, um, gave formed the focal point of a, of, of a really um, busy, popular day. Um, we hoped to rerun the event the following year, but um, due to COVID, we had to do it just as a virtual event, um, at which we then launched uh, a campaign, uh, an online campaign to, to gather signatures, and 104,000 people signed um, up to uh, support the Love Minsmere campaign um, and show their objections to uh, um, to the building of Sizewell C. Um, of course, we now know that uh, um, the Tory government uh, have given the go-ahead despite the um, uh, advice uh, of their own planning inspectors. Uh, and we, yeah, we haven't given up the fight, but we do anticipate that building work will uh, will start fairly soon um, in a ten-year build phase of Sizewell C, which will go on for. Um, 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, at least 10 years. Uh, we're going to have noise, light and dust pollution on the very southern boundary of the reserve um, as the largest construction site in Europe um, will, will, will be um, uh, overlooking us. Um, a, a village of 3,000 workers, um, just a mile or so from the reserve boundary. Um, and uh, yeah, we expect there to be uh, a serious impacts on the hydrology of the site as well as the the, uh, the coastal processes um, uh, and uh, the noise, light and dust pollution. It will have an impact on our wildlife. It will have an impact on uh, on people uh, living and visiting the area um, with the amount of traffic um, that's going to be uh, 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 bringing materials um, up the uh, single carriageway A12 um, to the area. So, um, yeah, we will continue to fight um, and hopefully the... Um, uh, the financial uh, situation with EDF will um, work in our favour and it continues to delay um, the, the start of the project um, until it becomes uh, uh, a no-go. But uh, it is going to be a case of watch this space, unfortunately. Um, there are many ways you can keep in touch with us at Minsmere. Um, you can uh, check our website, rspb.org.uk forward slash Minsmere. Um, I write uh, at least a weekly blog on there. Um, you can also follow us on both Facebook and Twitter at RSPB Minsmere um, and see some of the uh, uh, amazing uh, photos and videos that we take uh, around the reserve and keep up to date with our wildlife. Um, now, it's obligatory when you're giving a talk on wildlife, I think, to end uh, with a sunset. A sunset and an avocet sounds uh, like a perfect combination at Minsmere, um, but I've never been one to follow the rules. Um, so I don't end with the sunset. Um, I... Uh, I, I'll let this, uh, um, this, this red deer stag um, bid you good, good, good night. Um, thanks for your support and uh, thanks for listening. Um, I'll hand you over to uh, Andrew, I think, for leading any questions. Can I I'll ask a question for you? I know it must be, maybe it's an unfair question, but, you know, given you spend a lot of time there, do you have a favourite area of the reserve? Oh, absolutely. Island Mere. Every time. Um, yeah. Uh, and yes, I was one of those who used to sit in the top right hand corner of that dark, damp hide and not have to talk to anyone. Um, I did get caught out doing that once when I was a volunteer in my um, before I worked at Minsmere uh, in the days when we used to check permits. And I was sitting up there and a group of people walked in through the door um, and went downstairs. So I went down to ask for their permits, only to find that it was Bill Oddy and our then warden leading a, a VIP tour. Um, uh, so um, I quickly retreated upstairs into the dark. But uh, now I could spend hours sitting in the Isle of Mere hide, um, watching bitterns, harriers, uh, waiting for the barn owl to come over at dusk, um, just taking in the the, the views, um, which unfortunately are going to be blighted when they start building uh, the power station because it will be you know, right in the line of yeah. sight. But uh, um, yeah, the the the, the bitterns will continue to to be the draw down to Isle of Mere. Yeah, it is a great spot. Yeah. Hi, thanks very much. It was really uh, fascinating and encouraging to see how different species have 
developed and fared really well over the years. I first visited Minsme in the mid 70s and at that time I was very fortunate to see redback shrike that bred there on the on the reserve. Do you think there's any prospect of redback shrike returning or any are there any other species that you'd like to see return that have, have since been lost? Uh well redback shrike is I mean obviously we see them still as as migrants they have bred in the UK in recent years so yeah there is the the, the yeah the chance of occasional breeding um the habitat is there um i think climatically i think is one of the that's probably one of the factors that's affected um red bat shrikes obviously food availability in the wider landscape uh, and the decline in the northwest european population anyway so it that, that yeah possibly um would i like to see a bird bat i never saw a lesser spotted woodpecker at minsmere um i think the chances of one coming back are nil um given that there are barely any left in Suffolk. Um, I did did see a willow tit at Minsmere, but there are none of them left in Suffolk, so chances again are probably nil. Um, red squirrel? Yeah, it would require a reintroduction, um, but yeah, red squirrel could come back. Um, I mean, it's an interesting one, because obviously it's rather than species coming back, it's species that we have... Yeah, you know, we are getting colonised, natural colonisers. You know, like I've you know, mentioned with um, willow emerald damsel, um, uh, silver wash fertility in recent years, massive population explosion in East Anglia. Um, used to be a major rarity. Um, uh, the interesting one this year, the new one for me on the reserve this year was was polecat. Um, now I grew up on the Shropshire borders, which was the the. 20 years ago was the strong, the only the, the stronghold in the UK. And you never saw them. I saw a dead one about 30 years ago on the roadside. Um, in the last three years, I've seen six dead polecats in Suffolk and one live one at Minsmere. Um, and, you know, whether they are all pure polecat or polecat ferret escapees is out for debate because unless you get the DNA, D- DNA, it's virtually virtually impossible to tell in the field. But yeah, you know, there are new species turning up all of the time. Um, yeah, you know, um, I, I mean, yeah, you know, seeing things like ant lions and the the, the, the the insects in Digger Alley, um, birds nest fungi species that I'd never even heard of until even a few years ago. Um, yeah, I'll hold my hands up. I was a I was a bird watcher from the age of six, um, and mammals might have caught my eye on the lucky occasion that you got to see them butterflies and dragonflies were nice to look at but i didn't know what they were until 25 years ago um in the 20 years i've been spending i've spent at minsmere uh, i uh, i've learned a hell of a lot more but we've got 6500 species being identified at minsmere um i've probably seen uh, i suspect maybe 1500 of them <laughs> 300 or so of those are birds and probably probably another couple of hundred of moths and uh, uh in, in a moth chat which someone's identified for me uh, <laughs> um yeah so yeah there's always going to be something to see thank you i'm just picking up on james's comment at, question actually in terms of my favorite spot i mean the question i usually get asked is what my favorite bird is um and in the uk a no-brainer for me there are there's a, there's a very close second which is kestrel because I grew up as a YOC member with the hovering kestrel and that will always be up there. But no brainer for me, starling every time. Whether it's a common, the, the you know, beautiful, gorgeous starlings squabbling over the feeders or sixty thousand swirling around at dusk, um, yeah, I couldn't lose the starlings. We've got a coach trip coming to the reserve in February. Is there any chance we might still get starlings? There? Hopefully. Um, it's always one of those, they can be with us any time from late September to mid-April. Um, sometimes they're with us for two days during that period. Sometimes they're with us for a couple of months. We've had up to 10,000 um, through November. Um, they disappeared for two days and then relocated to a different part of the reserve, but it seems to be about 5,000 at the moment. By February, I'd imagine they will have moved, but they might also have moved back. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, keep, well, your eye on your blog. keep your eye on the blog, keep your eye on Facebook plan if possible for the coach to leave after dusk anyway, because even if the starlings aren't there, go and sit in, uh, Bittenhide and we've got 25 marsh areas coming into roost in the evenings at the moment as well, or go and sit in Island Mirhide and wait for the otter or the bit or the barn owl. 
Um, so if we, even if we haven't got starlings, there's something to see at dusk. Thank you. That's Just good. make sure you get to the cafe before it closes, before you go out to dusk at dusk, and you've got a hot drink inside you. Yeah, <laughs> a wise tip. Thank you. Hello. Can I just ask a question about um, the one bird that I've been looking forward to seeing since I was six, four, two, I don't know, <laughs> since I had an observer's book was the golden oriole. Yeah. Um, and I was just absolutely, you know, in trance with this bird. I, it was one that I had to see it as a, and a hoopoe, which yep. I did see when I was eight in Devon. <laughs> yep. But um, any chance of them returning? Um, if you want to see a golden oriole, I would suggest that you go to the Loire Valley, the Dordogne. No, it's got um, to be the country. Like that, unfortunately. Um, yeah. In the UK, they're no longer a breeding bird in Britain. They've disappeared from the fens. Um, yeah. we, get the, we get a singing bird most springs. Um, okay. Your chances of seeing a golden oriole, even when you get a singing bird, are very low. I mean, say, I've heard them, well, I say we, we get at least one most springs. I've probably heard... In 20 years, I've probably heard them singing on the reserve six times. I saw one three or four springs ago for two seconds. Oh, okay. Um, and, yeah, we had, we had a regular singing bird this year, and I never heard it. Um, you just have to be in the right place at the right time. Mm. If you want to see a golden oriole in Britain, I would say that you need to set up, um, you need to spend as long as possible during may particularly the first half of may sitting at a at a at a, 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 a um a sea watching headland right uh, such, such, such as portland bill or, yeah. or, or 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 beachy head um um or you need to be uh keeping a you, you need to have subscribed to um bird guides or or rare bird alert and get your get your notifications and go as soon as one is report, reported because in very as, as soon as one is reported as showing well, because okay. if it's showing well, it's showing well for five minutes, once a day, and it might not be there the next day. Um, if it's not showing well, it's probably only singing. All right. Well, um, was there some reason that they sort of declined in, in the they UK? Were, they were only ever very rare breeding birds in Britain. Okay. Um, they were at the climatic extreme, climatic edge of their range, um, and their habitat primarily was poplar plantations. Yeah, uh, which were planted to uh, produce planted by Brian's in May. Right. Uh, yes. Right. <laughs> uh, and of course, they don't need to plant them anymore. So yeah. there, there are very few poplar plantations left. Um, there were the few that there were also then wiped out uh, by egg collectors. Um, and sadly, the last pairs that nested at the well-known sites like Fordham, um, they're down in Market, and then at Lake and Heath, probably. Right just suffered from uh, too much disturbance from bird watchers wanted to see them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Good, good luck. Uh, yeah. so I think I've seen, I've seen three in Britain. If you want to see one, I mean the, the absolute best way, best, best way you're going to see a golden oriole, I would suggest from my experience would be to go to Poland, to go to the Ebsha marshes or be elevated. Right. Coast. Yeah. It's okay. not in Britain, but they are, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, I hope to see some of you at Minsmere, if not on your coach ship, then um, independently. Um, you know, if you are there and you come, yeah, and I'm around, yeah, say hello. Um, if it's a Sunday you're coming, I probably won't be there, unfortunately. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I might. I, I, I'll hopefully see some of you around. Good. We're, I think both are. Uh trips are on Saturday so you, you may have to I, put up I might be <laughs> <laughs> I work one or two Saturdays a month usually okay well can I on behalf of everyone can I thank Ian for a very interesting talk uh, I'm sure we all learnt a lot thanks everyone and uh, see you all soon